All right, so good evening, everyone. Welcome to, I guess, what will be our last Café Scientifique of our extended summer session. So we've been operating through April, May and June. And uh, what we've actually decided is we're going to take a break in July and August, give us a chance to prepare to essentially bring you a full online schedule starting in September. So uh, we've got a great talk this evening. Just before I introduce this evening's speaker, let me also let you know that um, if you have just joined us, don't worry about your microphone. I've turned the microphones off for all of our participants, so you don't have to worry about a hot mic. Um, for those of your friends and colleagues who weren't able to join us this evening, don't forget that we now have a YouTube channel, UVIC Cafe Sci, where all of these talks are archived and can be accessed. And so, uh, with no further ado, let me introduce this evening's speaker to you. So our speaker this evening is Catherine Elvira, and you are a very recent hire at UVIC, is that right? How long have you been at UVIC now? Um, so I started January 2017, so definitely recent, but not, you know, not in the last year or so. It feels like last year, uh, time yeah. when you're having fun. I'm glad it all still feels so new. So Catherine is going to be continuing our series of health-related talks we've had over the past couple of months. She's going to be telling us this evening about modelling the gut on a chip for drug discovery. All yours, Catherine. Fantastic. Well, thank you for coming. Um, I know this is a much more awkward format than the normal cafe scientific, but I just wanted to highlight that I do think that there is one advantage to doing it this way, and hopefully you'll see that through my presentation. Um, and that is that, um, as you will see, most of the data we gather in my lab is actually a video format. Um, so, of course, in the normal cafe scientific format, you wouldn't be able to see this, um, but hopefully that will be a nice advantage to doing this um, online now. So. Um, as John was saying, I'm going to tell you about the gut um, and how we can build a model of that on the chip and how we can use that to help us develop drugs, hopefully, um, and faster. So the three major things I want to tell you about today, the first of is like what is a lab on a chip or what is a microfluidic chip? Um, the second one is how do we make our chips? Because actually it's really hard to visualize what we do if you're not in the lab with us. Um, next, we're obviously going to talk about building these bespoke artificial cells and tissues on a chip and how we use that for drug discovery. And finally, I'm going to talk about beer on a chip. It's literally going to be one slide really fast, um, but it's a cool new project that we're doing um, at the moment with Philips Microbrewery here in Victoria. So I thought that would be a fun thing um, to add to the end of this presentation. Um, so what is a microfluidic chip? So I'm going to explain this in a couple of different ways because, as I said, it's kind of hard to visualize. Um, and the way I visualize it is that if you if you kind of remember back to the days when you might have been in a chemistry lab or, an, or uh, you know, in high school in some kind of lab setting, or you kind of visualize yourself doing um, cooking in the kitchen or something like that, what you're realistically doing is that you're using your hands um, to manipulate glassware or a glass in the kitchen or a measuring cylinder or a measuring jug in the kitchen um, to mix together what you need to do to be able to, to, to your reagents or your ingredients to be able to do um, make your final products. I'm kind of using language here from, from the kitchen but also from the lab. Okay, So, so in a traditional chemistry we usually use something that's made out of glass and um, it is usually usable in your human hand um, and you're usually working on scales that are around, I don't know, a few hundred milliliters um, um, of your reagents. Now, if you have more of a bio background or biology or biochemistry background, or if you're kind of interested in those um, forensic science uh, TV series, then perhaps what you're more familiar with is, is this next image that I've just brought up. So this is a 96 well plate. Um, it's plastic because in um, biology or biochemistry labs you want it to be disposable so you don't have to worry about cleanliness. Um, and what they've done here is that each of those little holes or plates that you see in that 96 well plate is a separate reaction. So you really, you know, decrease the volume size. You're working on, um, you know, the microliters to perhaps some of one milliliter volume. Um, you've also changed the material so that it's cheap and disposable, i.e. plastic. And you also might be automating this. So those um, four uh, things that you can see going into your 96 well plates are pipettes, and you can automate those into robotic systems. And the reason for that is obviously throughput, so you can do lots of reactions at the same time, um, but as well um, 
reproducibility. The robot is going to be much more accurate um, with what you put in there um, than a human. And so what I like to think of is that microfluidics or lab on a chip, which is the research area in which I work, is kind of a step forward. So what I have just brought up on the slide, on the right hand side of the slide, is a microfluidic chip. Um, so the chip is actually that tiny square or rectangular thing in the middle. If you look really closely, you'll be able to see kind of one long line in the middle of that chip. And that is a microfluidic channel or microfluidic uh, pipe. And that's what I'm going to be talking about in, in a minute. Um, and we've mounted that microfluidic chip on a microscope slide. And this is just something um, there so that we can put it on a microscope. Um, and see what's happening on this scale. So you've got, you know, from left to right on this slide, you've got huge scale, you know, your hands to manipulate things. Smaller scales use robotics or, or uh, pipettes to manipulate things. And on the right hand side, we've got tiny scale. So those pipes on there or those channels on that chip, uh, the width of a human hair effectively. And so you're using the chip architecture um, to manipulate your reagents to be able to do chemistry or biology. So another way to think of this is um, a chemical factory, right? So it looks ugly, it looks really not very green or, or pleasant, but actually what you're seeing here, um, if you look at it, is you can see some kind of big vats where they have reagents. You see all of those tubes um, that are mixing those uh, reagents together from the vats. I don't know exactly what this, what this chemical factory actually makes, but I always think of what we do on a chip is we miniaturize this um, to the scale um, of a human hair. Um, so this is an image of a chip on the right hand side. Um, and another thing to bear in mind here that this is the science of small plumbing. Normally when people say a chip or when you hear a chip, um, you're normally thinking of electronics. Um, we use the same word, but especially in this presentation, there's no electronics, it's all about fluid flow. Um, so it's all about pipes, so you can think of this as lots of tiny different pipes um, on this uh, chip. So on the right we have a chip, um, it's mounted on a microscope, that's where the light is coming. If you very, look very carefully you can see um, like the microscope objective at the bottom, like that kind of round thing that looks a bit like an eye, so that's you see what's going on in a chip. And then you can see those tubes, the pieces of tubing that are coming into the chip, and those will be attached to some kind of pump pumping system that allows us to kind of put um, the reagents or chemicals that we're interested in um, onto the chip. So the real, real, if you want to go scientific um, here, a very technical um, definition, um, microfluidic technology lab on a chips manipulate and process fluids and gases, though we won't talk about gases in this presentation, um, on scales below 500 micrometers, so that's below the width um, effectively of a human hair. Um, but realistically, if you're a grad student in my lab or you're working on this, realistically we're talking about the science of small plumbing. You've got the same problems as you have in any plumbing system. Leakages, you know, where is the fluid going? Um, you know, things get clogged. Um, for us, it's dust. Um, so we're working on, on that scale. Um, so why do we use microfluidic chips? So I think I've highlighted it really a lot, what we you know the, the reagent volumes that we're using so we're working really really small so on the nanoliter scale um, within this presentation it's high throughput we won't talk about that too much here but effectively we technically can do thousands of reactions um, or tests per second um, so that means that we have a lot of information really quickly um, enhanced experimental control that i will talk about, um, a lot in my presentation today um, efficient heat transfer so this is really obvious if you think about it. So if you're heating up a huge uh, vat of water to, to, to boil some pasta up, that's going to take a lot of time to heat up. But if you're heating up a tiny amount of water, it's a lot faster. And that's really helpful um, for some of the stuff we do on our chip. It's small footprint. So your chip is effectively the size of a postage stamp. Um, and it's green, right? So this is interesting for my work. But if you think of, of, of work where the chemicals are quite uh, toxic, for example, it's, it's nice because you're only using very small um, amount of these reagents. So for those of you with a more scientific bent on my, of mind or a more scientific background, if you look at the bottom of my slides, um, in some cases I've added a reference. So this is a paper um, which tells you more about this. So feel totally free um, to go and look at those if you're interested later on. So there's lots of different microfluidic chips. So remember, no electronics in this slide, um, but just this. Um, and in this presentation, we're going to talk about droplets. 
on a chip. Okay, so if you look here, I've got two representations of what a droplet is in my research. One in the middle of the slide is kind of drawing um, of what the chip looks like. And then I've kind of blown up a section of that chip and shown you a video of what's happening on the chip. So, so what we're doing here is we're mixing oil and water. So it's, it's exactly the same way as when you make a salad dressing, you mix something oily, like a, normally it's like a nice olive oil from Spain or something like that. Um, and then you mix something aqueous like vinegar, you mix it together, you might add some kind of stabilizer, um, as we would call it, like mustard or something like that, and that's your salad dressing. Um, and effectively, we are doing the same thing on a chip. So if you look at the diagram, at the top, we've got this one aqueous flow that comes from left to right, um, so something water-based. Um, and then we've got these two pinching oil flows that come from the top and the bottom. And as we pump these um, liquids into our chip, you've got these droplets forming. Um, but our droplets are formed of you know, perfectly the same size. They're all highly reproducible. Um, and we can make them and test them and analyze them effectively at thousands per second. So whenever I say droplet um, in the rest of the presentation, just remember this video. This is what we're using to make um, our artificial cells and tissues on a chip. So droplet microfluidics is a huge research area. Um, this is what it means. And now I'm going to tell you a bit about what we do in my lab at UBIC. Right. So for those of you that are more three-dimensionally inclined, this is kind of why we use droplets. Um, so just look at the images, that's probably the easiest way to think about this. But if you look on the left-hand side of that slide, you've basically got some reaction vessel, let's say a beaker. Um, and in that beaker, you've got two different types of molecules or two different types of cells. And so those are represented by the little round things and the little triangles in there. Um, and that's great. So you can do measurements on that or you could do um, tests of antibiotics on that if they're cells or whatever. But realistically, you're getting data from all of the things that are in that reaction volume or in that beaker. Um, you're not looking at each cell or each molecule individually. Right? So this is what we think of as, as, as um, large scale or traditional chemistry or biochemistry or biology. In the next um, image along, so the second from the left, what you can see there is, is, is a representation of droplets. Right. So we've taken that reaction volume and we've split it up into droplets. Um, but these droplets are tiny, as I showed you before. Um, and that means that you can put one cell or one droplet or a few molecules, so, sorry, one cell um, or a few molecules in each droplet. Um, and hence, you're basically compartmentalizing. And instead of putting effectively one into a huge volume, like imagine you put one cell into a beaker, that's, that's, you know, the scale is huge there. You're putting one cell into one small droplet, and then you can kind of see it and control it easily. And so the next image, the third one um, from the left, is showing that. So you kind of, each of your droplets has a content that you can look at. And of course, if you want to um, do lots of these at the same time, then you increase your, your throughput um, for the image on the right hand side. So that was a bit more of a technical explanation um, of what droplets are. So that's telling you what a microfluidic chip is, what a microfluidic droplet is, what a lab on a chip is, why we use them perhaps. So hopefully I've told you a bit about um, the basis here. And now I'm going to stop quickly and show you a video that was made by Julian Sketchley. So Julian um, is an undergraduate student. I think he's an English major um, at the University of Victoria. And he filmed a fantastic video um, of our lab um, and how we make those chips and use them in the lab. So I'm going to stop sharing um, and then I'm going to share the video because I think it really explains um, what we do in the lab. So give me two seconds. Um, to do that. So we need to change the application video to video. Okay, and that's just a nice full screen. Um, and so two minutes or three minutes of a video here. So to think of a tiny little piece of plastic around the size of a postage stamp. And imagine on there you can build tiny little pipes and little chambers. Think about like the width of a human hair, so really, really small. And we use them to do chemistry or biology on really small scales. What we do is we build artificial cells on a chip. So we are very interested in the cell membrane. The cell membrane is, is kind of the skin of the cell. It covers the cell and it allows the cell to communicate with the outside world. So we build these artificial cells by building the cell membrane on these chips and using that to look at drugs get into cells. 
What I'm really interested in uh, investigating with our artificial cells on a chip is being able to predict how a new drug behaves in the human body before we put it into human beings. It takes around 10 to 15 years and around 2.6 billion US dollars to develop a new drug. And a surprising amount of new drugs fail when we try and test them in humans. There are a lot of things going on in the cell. There's, the cell is really complex. There's lots of components, there's lots of proteins, there's lots of um, other chemicals around. And so you can't necessarily tell what part of the cell your drug is interacting with. So if we can predict how they're going to interact with human cells well before we need to do any testing in humans, we might be able to develop drugs faster and cheaper than we do so now. One of the things that we do on our microfluidic chips is build droplets, okay? So droplets are like any drop of water, a raindrop, that's a, a droplet, but we make these on a much, much smaller scale that you can only see under a microscope. We do that on a chip and at really high throughput, so that means thousands of these droplets per second. So then once we've made these droplets, we can add the molecules that make up a cell membrane. It gives us a huge amount of control over the chemistry and the biology that we do. What we want to do is build these artificial cells to be as similar as possible to real cells, but we can identify and design exactly what components we want them to have. When I was an undergraduate student, it felt like this was the, the technology of the future, no? As you know, phones used to be these huge uh, pieces of furniture almost that you would have in your house, and now we've got these tiny mobile phones. In the same way, I kind of think that, you know, now you're in a chemistry lab, and you would probably use some, some glassware to pour some liquids together to do a reaction, but it's, it's, it's big volumes of liquid, and now we can do that on a chip with tiny, tiny amounts of liquids. At the moment, they're very simple artificial cells, but the idea is that as we get better at building them and we do more research in this area, we can make them really similar, at least to the cell membrane, to the cell skin of normal cells. Right, so that was a very introduction to what we do in the lab. Hopefully you saw me building uh, or making an artificial um, a chip as well. Um, which was quite fun. Let me just go back to the presentation here. Um, but also what you saw was a bit of the, um, or what I explained, I guess, more accurately, was a bit of the basis for what we do. So we build these artificial cells on a chip and these artificial tissues on a chip. Um, and now I'm going to tell you how we do that um, and why. Okay. So it's relatively simple. So you've got your um, little water type or aqueous droplet and you've got an oil phase around it. Um, and as I said when I was using the, the salad dressing analogy, if you shake up some oil and water together, um, you basically do form some kind of emulsion or some kind of mixture of that water and oil. Um, but over time, they separate out into two phases, right? Um, so what we do add, both in a salad dressing and in my chip, um, ironically, is we add a stabilizing molecule in the salad dressing. It might be some mayonnaise or it might be some um, mustard here. In my case, it's what we call a phospholipid. Um, so phospholipids are actually the molecules that form the cell membrane or the cell skin um, in all types of, of cells. So um, what happens here in this slide, if you look from left to right on that diagram at the top, um, we've got a blue droplet or two blue droplets in each um, vignette. Um, the outside, the white background is your oil phase. I'm, I'm not representing that here necessarily. And then you've got these tiny little molecules that have kind of a brownish head group and two little tails poking out. Um, and they start to cover um, those droplets in our microfluidic chip. So that's what we call monolayer formation. So it's just one layer um, of those uh, phospholipids form on the surface. And they do this um, because your head group, the round bit, um, really wants to be in a, in a water phase. And your tail groups, um, the bits that stick out into the white background, um, really want to be in your oil phase. And so when you've got that full monolayer formation, um, we use our chip to bring those droplets together, as you can see in the video um, at the bottom of the slide. Of course, there you can't see the, the molecules, right, because they're so small, um, but we're representing them on the image above. And then you bring them together, bring them together, and you use dib formation. And a dib is a droplet interface bilayer. So you're forming a bilayer, two layers, um, at the interface between two droplets. So that was too technical and boring. That's totally fine. All you need to remember um, when you think of a, or a dip or drop-in to face bilayers that you're forming 
a tiny section of the cell membrane. And if you look at the, the video at the bottom, you can see that as those droplets touch, they almost kind of glow um, where they touch. And that is basically a really good sign um, that you're forming a, an artificial cell membrane um, between two droplets. So this is actually work that I started during my PhD. It's not what my PhD was on. This was kind of a, a separate project that just was really interesting I wanted to work on. Um, and we made a really, really simple chip um, to build these artificial cell membranes or DIVs, our uh, drop-in interface bilayers, in almost like three-dimensional ways if you look at that um, uh, image on the top left. Um, and the other beautiful thing of these DIVs, if you think about it, is if you have two droplets and then the, the artificial cell membrane in between them is that you basically have a donor compartment on one side of your artificial cell membrane and an acceptor compartment on the other side. So if you look at those images on the right hand side of the slide, that's effectively what I'm showing there. So we've got four droplets um, in each of the columns, it's the same droplets. The left hand column is kind of what we call bright field, so that's what you'd see if you just look down the microscope. The right hand column is, is a fluorescent view, so it allows us to be much more um, sensitive um, to where those fluorescent molecules are. Um, and so what we've done in those um, images on the left hand side is we've got alternating droplets. So there's a bit of a yellow one and then a kind of whitish bluish one and then a yellow and whitish bluish one. So the yellow one means that we've dosed, you know, fluorophore something, a dye effectively in there. And then we're looking um, at how that dye goes through that cell membrane um, into the empty droplet on the right hand side. And so we've got two of those. If you look at the images that are effectively black and white on there, you can see that at the top image, there's kind of no dye in those, those empty droplets. But as time goes past, so over the course of 20 hours, you can see that dye percolate through that artificial cell membrane, so through both of those artificial cell membranes, um, into the empty droplets. And this is the core technology um, that we use in, in our lab, is this idea of building artificial cell membranes and then being able to see how much goes through them. So this is a better representation, right? So what we are really interested in doing is saying, okay, it's really hard to develop new drugs, and as we are all extremely aware of um, in this day and age. It's actually really costly, it takes a lot of time, um, and you know, you're doing clinical trials, which are your trials in humans, right at the end of this really long process, and suddenly you decide that this, you know, this drug that you've developed and that has cost so much time and money is not getting into your cells. So effectively, it's useless, right? Um, so what we want to do is we want to build bespoke artificial cells and tissues on a chip um, that we can use really early on in the discovery process to kind of tell us how we can, how we think drugs might interact um, with real cells, okay, in a human being. Um, so the idea here is that they bespoke. So this is what we show in this slide. So you can build these little droplet interface bilayers and these artificial cells. So that's why they're different colors, right? So you can use different types of phospholipids. So we can see um, how different cells react. And then we can have different contents in each one. And then we can dose a drug um, in one of these, see how it percolates um, through this model system that we have built through um, on a chip. Um, so I'm going to go back again to the engineering and say, okay, that's where we want to go to. The previous slide is where we want to go to. We want to be able to build these, these models on a chip. Um, but realistically, um, it's actually quite hard to do that on a chip. So these two um, videos on the right-hand side um, describe what I call the droplet toolkit, right? If you want to mix something um, in, in, in the kitchen or in a lab, you literally just pour one liquid into the other. Um, but you can't really do that on a chip. So these are not my, uh, this is not my research right here that I'm showing you, but these I think are good examples of how actually you have to design quite um, complicated geometries or architectures on a chip to be able to do really simple things. So the top video there is that you can see us mixing, and, or, or the authors of this study, sorry, mixing two droplets, okay? Um, and the bottom one there, you're actually diluting. Um, so you're making things less concentrated. So if you look at how that in the video proceeds, you'll see that the droplets that come out on the right hand side are getting progressively lighter. Um, and so this is just to highlight um, the engineering side of our work. Where we spend quite a lot of time um, building these complex architectures to allow us to do um, all these different motions 
um, or um, actions on a chip. So no work would happen in my lab um, without my fantastic graduate students. I actually have four graduate students at the moment. Um, the fourth is not there. I'm the person in the, in the stripy uh, blue and red top there, if you can't tell. Um, from the video, which is probably quite small on your screens. The other three are uh, my three graduate students whose work I am presenting here. Um, so Jamie and Alana, who are to my right, are standing together, have done all of this work, um, and they are fantastic. And Caitlin will be doing part of the work that I'll show you later on. So building the gut on a chip. Okay, so normally there are different ways that you can take a, a drug or a medicine. You can take it orally, right? So like a, a tablet. Um, it can be intravenously or, or whatever. We're going to talk about what we call orally administered drugs. So any drug that you take through your mouth. Um, and so if you think about what that drug does, it, you take it in your mouth and then it goes into your stomach, into your intestine, and then it has to cross um, from the intestine into the blood, right? So you've effectively got your intestine. Um, and you've got your bloodstream and in between you've got a layer of cells that make your stomach wall okay so this is what we're trying to model on a chip and this is the chip um, that my students jamie and Alain, um developed to do this so it's relatively complicated but in the next slide i'm going to show you a video it's going to make life so much easier so if you look first at the right hand side you can see our images there on a chip of these little droplets that we're making and we've labeled them a b and c okay so a is compartment one B is compartment two, C is compartment C, and those arrows show where those artificial cell membranes are that we are building, like I explained before, these droplets into place by layers um, or dips. So the idea here is that we'll be able to dose something into A and see how it goes to B and C. Um, and so the chip, if you look on the left-hand side, um, you've got three inlets, A plus inlet A, B and C, so we have three different um, droplets on our chip, and then we've got one oil inlet, um, you make these droplets and then you bring them together, as I will show right now. Okay, so this is us making the three droplets, A, B, and C from top to bottom. They flow together and then when we get a nice um, arrangement of those droplets, we stop the flow um, and then we start our experiment or our assay to see how, how the drug molecule or the dye molecule that we're using um, moves between those three droplets through those artificial cells and between those artificial cell membranes between the droplets. So if you look on the right hand side of this slide, that's the image that I showed you before, right? We want to be able to have three different droplets that show three different um, aspects of this system. Um, on the left hand side is, is, the, is effectively um, the experimental version of that. Um, and when we're modeling the gut on the chip, this is what we're doing, okay? So our top droplet models the gut. Um, and that means that we're using um, the similar conditions that you would find in a human gut. So, for example, pH, so how acidic it is, um, but also the concentration of salts, because that's quite um, important for how drugs behave um, in a human. So that's our compartment one, our top one. Um, the middle represents an intestinal cell, so the cells that make up your um, intestinal wall. Okay. And this, again, the interior of that um, droplet mimics those pH or those acidity conditions and the salt conditions found in cells. And then the last droplet represented in red represents the bloodstream. So again, that's a pH of blood, which is about seven, and it also has um, similar salt compositions to what you would find in blood. Um, and then in the top one, in the grey droplet there that represents the blood, we've got some little black squares that represent our, our dye molecule that we're using to test the system and what we're hoping is that dye that will go from from the gut to the intestinal cell and into the bloodstream and we'll be able to see um, how that drug distributes within this system um, and then correlate that to whether the same would happen um, in a human okay now this is the only slide that i will show you with with, with you know graphs which are obviously not um, not that much fun to watch um, at six o'clock in the evening. Um, but what we're seeing here is really interesting. So we tested this initially with dye. Okay, so it's just those black little squares in, in, in our gut droplet uh, are a dye. And so if you look at the black line on that graph, you can see that at the beginning, at time zero, it was super high. And then rapidly, it goes away from, from, from droplet number one. Okay. Then if you look at how much of that dye is in the blue droplet or the purpley droplet, 
um, that represents your intestinal um, cells. You can see that at the beginning, the blue line starts effectively at zero, but if it quickly goes up. So there's a lot of transport. You, this dye that we're using goes really fast from the gut droplet to um, into your um, uh, intestinal cells. And then if you look at the red line, um, which represents how much of that drug is in, in, in the blood droplet, you can see that it does start low, but that slowly it increases. So if you um, use this to model a drug, and this is the data you get, you would be saying, okay, this is a drug that really leaves your gut very easily, um, but actually you're not getting that much in it into your bloodstream for quite a while. So actually the distribution of the drug within your whole body rather than just in your gut is relatively slow. And that might be good um, or it might be bad, but it's telling you something about that behavior of that drug um, in humans, which is quite nice. So actually we did compare this data uh, for data, not in humans because we don't, we're not quite there yet, um, but with cells and we could show that we were, we, three, we were three times better at predicting where this dye would end up um, than the current state of the art industry technique, which was really exciting. Um, and as you can see, we just published this research um, earlier this year. So realistically, what I've told you about at the moment is, is on the left-hand side of this slide. We've got a drug, we've got a section of the cell, um, cell membrane, which is highlighted in that little red box and looking at how much goes through. And it's a great system and, it, and it's obviously really good at, at helping us understand what's happening in, in um, real cell models. But realistically, a cell um, looks much more like that image on the right hand side. Okay, so you've still got that bilayer the whole way around the cell rather than our bilayer section um, on the left hand side, but you've also got loads of other things in the cell wall, and that's completely ignoring what's within your cell, right? We're just looking um, at that first barrier um, for the drug to get into the cell, which is effectively the cell membrane. So I've highlighted some things there. You've got lots of different types of proteins there, you've got lots of different types of lipids, you've got cholesterol. And as you can see at the bottom, I've given you a little drug model and showing you that sometimes drugs can also go um, into the cell through these transport proteins. So we're actually working on, on increasing the complexity um, of these artificial cells and tissues on a chip. Um, if you're interested, we really, really recently got a grant to build the blood-brain barrier um, on a chip. And that's the barrier that protects your brain um, from the rest of your body. Um, or from more accurately from components in your blood. So that's why it's quite complicated um, to cure things like Alzheimer's disease or treat things like Alzheimer's disease um, because it's hard to get um, drug molecules into your brain. So we're going to be building a model of the blood brain barrier um, on a chip um, to help us develop drugs for Alzheimer's disease, which is very exciting. So watch the space. So another project that we do um, is about proto tissues. Okay. So obviously cells are really interesting, but in your body, you don't get single cells floating around. You're much more likely to have <laughs> tissues. Um, and so this is in co collaboration with Pierangelo Gobo. So you can see a little picture of him on the top right hand side. And he's a researcher um, at the University of Bristol in the UK. And what he's done is he's built these really simple models of tissues. Um, not on a chip. He, does, he doesn't do chip work. And if you look at that video on the right hand side, you can see kind of those artificial cells come together um, and as we cycle through temperatures they have these collective motions and this the the, the effect of the definition of a tissue is that they have collective behavior so all the cells in your tissues come together to perform an action so i'm not going to go into too much detail about this um, because we haven't yet published this work um, and uh, it's quite a lot of detail for, for a short presentation but what i'd like to show you um, is the microfidic side. So if we go back one step, yes, yeah, sorry, um, you'll see the proto tissue on the left. Um, normally in your tissue, you have several different types of cells. So in that tissue that we're showing on the left hand side, he's got the red cells um, and the green cells, but he has really no control over how many red cells, how many green cells are in that tissue, and also how big they are, how small they are. So you can see that they're quite um, varied in size. And so, of course, this was a, a perfect. Um, collaboration and that we can use our microfidic chips and make these artificial tissues much more accurately. So I'm going to show you three videos um, and then move on to the final slide in my presentation, which is about um, uh, beer on a chip. And so what I'm just going to show you here is here is us 
making these proto tissues. So on the left, we have two different types of artificial cells coming in. And then on the right, we have a proto tissue coming out, but where we can be very accurate about how many go in each of our, of our proto tissue. So this is us targeting two proto tissues per chip. Oh, sorry, one proto tissue per chip. This is us targeting two proto tissues to, sorry, two proto cells for each proto tissue. You'll see that it's not 100% accurate, but it's much more accurate than what we can do um, off chip. Here is us targeting three proto cells, four cells in each tissue. So again, not 100% accurate, but really, we can really enrich these samples and get much more accuracy than off chip. Um, and here is us targeting four proto tissues, proto cells in each proto tissue. So just to wrap things up, I want to tell you about a project that we're doing um, with Philips Brewing and Malting Company here in Berea. Um, this is about beer. So um, I am not a great beer drinker, and I'm going to use that as an excuse um, for not knowing that beer effectively is an emulsion. Okay? So your beer is effectively mostly water, um, but if you're into IPAs or India Pale Ales, that India Pale Ale flavor that you get is actually um, an essential oil that comes from the hops plant or a, or a bunch or a mix of essential oils that comes from, from, from the hops plant. So actually, if you, if you look at your beer microscopically, you've got this big vat of, of, of water and alcohol and other things, and then you've got these tiny droplets um, of beer IPA flavors floating around in your beer. And so uh, Ewan Thompson, who used to work at Philips, and I, um, met at a conference and we decided that we really wanted to investigate this on a chip um, and the reason for this is actually they want to be able to know um, how these uh, IPA flavors behave in beers um, because they behave or the flavor that they give a beer um, changes depending on for example how beers are stored whether they're in the fridge or not you know how old your beer is so how stable are these emulsions um, and the other reason why I'm really proud of this project is actually uh, Jaling, Katie, who's in this photo, and Danielle, um, who have done this uh, work, are all undergraduate students um, at UVic. So they've been doing their honor thesis um, in my labs um, over the last couple of years, and they've done all of this research. So if you're interested in, in seeing this, again, watch this space. We will be talking about this, I'm sure, at some stage on social media. Um, but it's also fantastic to be able to collaborate um, with a beer company. Um, so it just, I think, shows you a bit more and what we can do. Um, yeah. So we always have to finish with acknowledgements. I hope that you're proud, John, that I did put the Centre for Biomedical Research at the bottom in my acknowledgements. Um, but the work that I've shown today is from Ilana, Jamie, and Caitlin, my graduate students. Uh, Ricardo, Jal Jaling, Daniel, and um, Katie are uh, all undergraduate students. Ricardo did those initial videos for us, and Jaling, Katie, um, and Daniel uh, were working on the BIA project. And of course, I have funding from lots of different sources. Uh, but mostly uh, through the ones I show here, my Canada Research Chair, um, NSERC, and the Canada Foundation for Innovation. Um, and with that, I will leave you with this final slide, um, which shows where you can learn more about us. We have huge amounts of videos um, on our website and social media accounts. So if this is your thing, uh, feel free to, to come to, to see what we do um, in another format. And, for, and that's it from me. All right, thank you, Catherine. What a wonderful talk. And uh, before I invite people to um, start asking questions on the chat, um, we have a tradition at Cafe Sty uh, online um, that uh, we do virtual applause with the audience all raising their hands simultaneously. So uh, let's go for it, everyone. Let's uh, show our appreciation for Catherine's talk. Wonderful job, guys. I know I can always count on you. So, um, what I will also let you know is, um, if you don't know as a participant, if you go to the um, uh, little magenta tab in the bottom right, uh, click on that, and then you'll see at the bottom of that new sidebar that opens up, a little speech bubble. That's where you can uh, type in a message into the chat function, and we'll all be able to read that. So uh, that's how people seem to prefer asking questions. So if you have a question for Catherine, 
please get typing away. Um, while you're doing that, um, I was just going to ask a, a first question, Catherine, if I may. And sure. um, uh, it, it really seems like you have, via this technique of microfluidics, there is a huge biological landscape that is available to you to investigate. And my first reaction is how daunting that must be. And it's like, you know, you know, going to a Canadian national park for the first time. How do you choose where you're going to go, where you're going to explore? What, what, what kind of guides you through that process? Okay, so you did have to start with the complicated questions, didn't you? <laughs> no, so that's a, that's a great question. And I just want to say that that idea of um, everyone raising their hand as applause is really effective, actually, because I've been in a lot of these online lectures and it's, it's very one-sided right, from the presenter's point of view. So thank you. Thank you for taking part from that perspective. Um, realistically, I think we start with, with what will give us an answer it's a very boring answer question, like answer to your question effectively. We start with something that will give us an answer that proves um, that this is a valid model, if you see what I mean. Imagine we decided to do something extremely complicated um, and then it really doesn't predict how a drug behaves in, 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 in a human, then you have kind of uh, lost a lot of opportunities for problem solving along the way. So we tend to do something very simple, so something that is orally administered is very simple, something that goes through the cell membrane rather than through a protein, which is a lot more simple, um, than adding proteins to this, to this um, um, system. So that's how we choose. But it's also kind of what disease we're targeting, right? So there's a lot of diseases that are extremely uh, well researched and we know a lot about, um, but there's other diseases that are not as well researched and we don't know a lot about so it's that kind of balance between those so alzheimer's disease we have a lot of unanswered questions there from the fundamental science perspective but also from the drug perspective um, so that's kind of why we're looking um, at that as a specific disease um, initially yeah mm -hmm. and uh, well i guess you know your, your answer is i think the answer that almost all scientists would give that in in, in some ways science is the the art of working out what's possible right which questions are answerable in you know the amount of time or the amount of resources we have available to us and you know focusing on those and dreaming of one day the ones that are beyond our abilities yeah. so i couldn't have said it better myself frankly <laughs> right no that's no it well I, I only say it like that because that confronts us all right mm -hmm. especially when we're you know at the stage in our career where we have to do a new thing which is actually plan research programs for the next three five ten years you know that this you know this kind of approach i have to say i'm pretty lucky for that perspective because um the new frontiers grant is actually a grant by the there's a new granting system i don't know if you've come across it i'm sure you have um, no okay it's a new grant system from the canadian government to fund high risk high reward research um, so it's high risk in that actually you know it's, it's relatively blue sky the things that we're doing um, in that grant but it's also high reward so you know if, if we get this working it could tell us a lot about something we don't know a lot about so that's that's a really great program um, but also through my Canada research chair they do kind of push us a bit more towards that that high risk high risk high reward research so, so I really am lucky from that perspective <laughs> so I can't say that this is easy for all scientists because as you know um, getting funding is not not straightforward but it, it definitely helps um, having these types of programs in Canada well that's very encouraging to hear and, and so what you know and that's a message we don't often see is that you're you're finding you're well encouraged to challenge yourself yeah is that, I mean, is that after 10 years when I'm a jaded you know um, tenured professor um, or assistant or associate professor and then I might give you a different answer but right now it's a, it's a great it's a great landscape to be an assistant prof in no comment I'm not gonna not, not, no comment there <laughs> so um, for those of you uh, listening and watching this is just to encourage you that uh, we've got a few extra minutes if you want to type something into the uh, the chat bar if you have a particular question if you don't that's that's fine um, so I guess um, one other question I, I had, Catherine, is, you know, so it seems as well that, you know, there's quite an, an engineering aspect, a microengineering aspect mm -hmm. to, to your research as well. And it, is that kind of a skill, what stage in your career did you kind of assimilate that? Because that's a, that's a very particular skill to, to bring into um, 
you know, uh, this sort of chemical biological interface? Yeah, that's a, another excellent question. And just for everyone out there, I'm very happy to answer kind of more more personal or career related questions from that perspective. I'm relatively open as a as a person. So actually, this is not is not generally something that you you get to do as an undergrad. Um, mm -hmm. So I started this as a PhD student. Um, and in fact, most of the people I would say, especially in my lab, who come to do this, do it as a PhD student. So we've gotten really good um, at teaching our, our, our graduate students, or again, PhD or masters, I guess, is more accurately, to, to, to this whole new field in as little time as possible um, so that they can do new research in it. So we have a really, <laughs> really well developed training program um, for them. And by training program, I don't mean a degree course or whatever, I just mean kind of a training program in, in my lab. Um, to develop that and talking to my colleagues in the field it's, it's pretty pretty common to do this to have a, a training process in our lab so, so realistically yeah I think it would be something you would learn as a, as a grad student um, okay. more than an undergrad I know there are a few courses who have it so bio, bioengineering at UVic no it's, no it's biomedical engineering at UVic isn't it um, they do have some uh, undergraduate courses on this but again you're not really in the lab most of the time so you probably understand mm -hmm. the theory of the field but you don't necessarily understand you don't know how to do things in the lab to to a huge extent and so again they're going to have to learn um, in the lab if they want to come and do a research project in, in microfysics lab so yeah yeah well I guess it's interesting that difference you mentioned between graduate and undergraduate because my sense is that undergraduates going through their labs are concentrating on getting things right whereas at the graduate level you try and push them into a certain wider range of situations where there's a freedom to get it wrong right yeah. and you know, that, that's that's a very different mindset for them as well so it must be exciting working with your your group i mean i think this is a general thing in science right like you <laughs> you almost have to learn how to get it wrong, especially when you're kind of a really great undergrad student and you're getting you know, 90% or 100% in the exam. You know, if my research worked 90% of the time, all the time, I, it would, I'd be ecstatic, that would be <laughs> fantastic. We could do like, you know, one month PhDs or something, I'm exaggerating, but something like that. Um, but yeah, it's that trying and failing and then problem solving and then coming back and trying again. Um, that's, it's, it's the stamina that you need to do a PhD. Mm. So we have a question on the chat from uh, Jim Hesser, and uh, Jim was just uh, interested to know, how has your work in the lab been impacted by the COVID-19 shutdown? Are you able to access the lab now? Yeah, great question. Um, uh, yeah, so at the moment, we closed down, you closed down our research labs, I think it was sometime in March. I'm, I'm obviously trying to blank that um, because it was, it was a bad day. We obviously knew it was coming, seeing how things were developing in the world. Um, but yeah, we closed down. And the funny thing is that no one teaches you how to close down a lab. They definitely teach you how to start a lab and keep it going. But, but closing it down was complex. Even silly things like, oh, I didn't realize, but my fridge and freezer are not on backup power. So if the power goes down, um, we will lose tens of thousands of dollars of, of reagents, right? So, so yeah, so, they, so that was a major problem. Um, phase one reopening of labs was June 1st. So we've actually been back in the lab um, a couple of weeks, but only one of my graduate students. So at the moment, my group is four graduate students, and one undergraduate student, and only one of them has been able to be um, in the lab. And then hopefully from July 1st, um, the rest of them will be able to go in, but we all have to physical, you know, be physically distanced um, in the lab. So we spent a lot of time um, as, as um, faculty members trying to sort out how we can keep them safe in the lab, right, and, and separate. And I have to say, for us, you know, it's not been as bad as for other groups. Um, so yes, there's been a pause of, you know, I would say on average about three months of, of, of lack of, of new research coming in. Um, but on the other hand, we were at the stage where we had a load of stuff to write up. So it wasn't, wasn't too bad. So you know, two weeks time, hopefully, fingers crossed, we'll all be back in the lab and that will be, <laughs> that will be good. And I think the other side that, that we don't really talk about as much um, generally in the sciences is the, is the mental health impact. Um, so just talking about myself, I'm not great at working from home. <laughs> I love the human interaction. Um, and so a lot of it has been a lot of time on Zoom and Skype and on phone calls, and it's, it's relatively exhausting, um, actually. So I'm really proud of how well my group has done um, in keeping going through all of this. It's been tough. It really has. 
Now, some of our audience might be aware that you haven't been completely idle and you haven't been completely absent from the lab, have you? <laughs> yeah, I've forgotten that too. <laughs> yeah, so um, being chemists, um, we decided to make some hand sanitizer. Um, we gave our first batch to uh, Vancouver Island Health. And um, I think we made three batches in total. I was involved in two, and the second batch went to UVic, obviously, for when we open. I don't know what we did with the third batch because I wasn't as involved. Um, but yeah, if you go on my on my social media on my website, you'll be able to find links to to um, <laughs> us making hand sanitizer in super fast videos um, in the lab. And it, I have to say, normally you wouldn't allow professors into the lab because we've been out of the lab for so long that that you know graduate students wouldn't trust us with equipment. Um, but in that, well, during lockdown, it was only us that was allowed um, in for COVID-specific work. So we were, we were making some hand sanitizer. Again, I do stuff on the scale of, you know, a human hair, and this was doing things on the scale of, of, of beer buckets. Um, so we had actually uh, the vats that we used were from a, a local brewery to help us mix, you know, hundreds of liters of this hand sanitizer. So it was really good fun, actually, hard work. Yeah. But um, um, for those of you watching who haven't seen those videos, um, I guess if you Google something like UVic hand sanitizer, um, they're, they're great videos, as you mentioned, the, the time lapse uh, videos of you all working in the lab. Yeah, they were quite fun. So um, before we thank Catherine finally for this evening and all go our separate ways, let me uh, just let you know as the audience what to expect over the next few months. So uh, let me see, what have we got? We've got July, we've got August. We're going to be um, taking a vacation, July and August. You're not going to hear from us at all. We will be back with our, um, our completely usual schedule in September. Everything is going to be online as we move through 2020 into 2021. So we're going to continue this model. Unfortunately, we don't anticipate being back at Herman's Jazz Bar anytime soon. But uh, I hope that uh, all of you uh, agree with me as well that the past three months have been a wonderful experience. And uh, I'm looking forward to um, being back with you guys in September. So um, as we uh, uh, go our separate ways, let's perhaps all raise our hands one last time and say thank you to Catherine for a wonderful presentation. I think we all enjoyed that. Thank you very much, Catherine. Thank you so much for coming. That was really good fun. <laughs>